Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our studies in the book of Zechariah, specifically as we look to finish up things with Zechariah 4, verse 6. Let us ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his blessing. And let us take time to thank him for the many blessings that he provided for all of us this last week. May his guidance be clear. May we seek his wisdom. May we come to a, a closer understanding of that which is presented for us at this time, so that we may understand more clearly that which we are to be doing. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, We thank you, Father, for the hours of the Sabbath. We thank you as well for this opportunity we have to join together at this time. Gracious Father, please direct us. Please show us that which you would have us to know. May your will be done. May our minds be opened to that which you would have us to understand. We thank you for the many blessings that you provided us this last week, as well as the blessings that we have of these Sabbath hours. Direct us now. May your angels attend us. May your spirit guide our conversation. And all that we have to address at this time in this meeting. Help us now, Father, so that your will is done. So that your character can be shown through all of that which we will be doing. I thank you for those that are attending this meeting. I thank you for those that will be attending and viewing this meeting later. Be with us now. Please guide us. We ask, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over the last several weeks, we have been delving directly into Zechariah 4, verse 6. If there is a single point that we have had to look at within this portion of the book of Zechariah, is there a, a succinct way that we can address it? How about John 3.30? He must increase. God must increase and we must decrease. Okay. <clears throat> what? Well, Go ahead. So um, I'm not sure which point. I mean, if you're just talking about verse 6 itself, or you're talking about the whole section. I'm speaking about verse 6 itself. I mean, isn't it succinct in and of itself already? Well, <clears throat> when we look at what has been going on within the church since 1844, do we not see <clears throat> that we've had too much reliance in the church and in the movement in the wisdom of man and not enough reliance upon the spirit of God.
Yeah. Uh, so the idea is that that the work is going to be accomplished by God's spirit, by his power. Right? Not by you know human devising or maneuvering or or plans or ideas. Um, so we, we study God's word and um, we allow him to show us truth. And we do the things that we're asked to do, right? Reflect his character, minister to those around us. But the overall work isn't done by one person or men organizing to do it. It's done through God's spirit. And so it takes faith uh, for that to happen. It's not that we have inaction, but that action is directed by God and doesn't always make sense to us, uh, you know, why God asks us to do certain things. We don't, we don't see everything as God sees it. Right. That wasn't very succinct. Well, no. It's a good a good point that I think we're all going to need as we go forward. Now, where we closed last week, we had these paragraphs from letter 44 of 1910. Satan is working in every conceivable manner to divert minds from the truth of God that would sanctify the soul. When the soul is being sanctified, what message is it accepting? Well, um, it's accepting the everlasting gospel. I mean, if you're trying to say, is it the first, second, or the third angel? um, I mean, all of them are involved in this work, justification, sanctification. Often we look at it, I guess, we could say it's the second angel, the work of sanctification, if we're going to use that illustration. Well, if we if we were placing this on a line, we would look at the sanctification being a portion of the second angel's message. Right. Yeah. Though people would often just say, oh, sanctification, that's the third angel's message of righteousness by the faith. But in a line, it's the second angel. So... <clears throat> Just as as we would look at another point, when when Christ was baptized and he went into the wilderness, he faced a series of tests. And those tests were addressed in three words. Or three sets of words. Do you recall what those are? When we look at this in the Gospel of of Matthew, Christ is presented with the test of appetite, presumption, and love of the world. And in each manner, if we are placing this onto a line, we could line up appetite with the first angel's message, presumption with the second, and love of the world with the third angel's message. Mrs. White is quite clear. Millions will fall based on the test of appetite. Millions more will fall on the ba- on the basis of presumption, thinking that man's wisdom is above God's. And the final test that will come, <clears throat> that of the love of the world, <clears throat> The love of believing that man has intelligence above that of God will be the final test. 
no one is free from the danger of becoming ensnared by the sophistry of the enemy. So if no one is free from this danger, can we also say that all are in danger of becoming ensnared by the sophistry of the angel, of the enemy? Our only safety is to hide self in Christ, the only begotten Son of God. We must rely wholly upon God. He is to be our efficiency. Unless the hearts of the people are reached by the heavenly powers, they cannot receive the grace of Christ. Now, this statement is quite telling. How many sermons, how many books, how many evangelistic series does it take to reach the heart of the people? The statement is clear. Unless the hearts of the people are reached by heavenly powers, this is not going to have an effect. We would urge that there be less of argumentative sermonizing and more of Jesus Christ revealed in the discourses. The power of a discourse is not increased by loud ejaculations. Let there be a, sermon, a realizing sense that the Lord must impart of his heavenly grace. We are constantly to work in harmony with the messengers of heaven. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Zechariah 4.6 Our wisdom is to be received from God through prayer. It is our privilege first to talk to God in the secret place of prayer. And then in the fervor of the spirit to give his message to the people as men who have learned lessons from God. With this preparation, our speech will be acceptable. The atmosphere surrounding us will be holy. <clears throat> for we shall be in cooperation with holy angels. When the melting power of God has subdued our hearts we shall have the power to draw with Christ. Oh, how much we have lost by not being converted <clears throat> daily. Many are careless and irreverent. They seem to have but little sense of the reality of the truth. Some who have received decided warnings seem to have no realizing sense of their peril. Now, the comment in the chat, these three tests, appetite, presumption, love of the world, originated in Genesis 3 with the temptation of Eve. Anyone else have a thought on that? Okay. Letter 128 of 1910. Are we looking for our Lord to come in the clouds of heaven? Satan is working with intensity of effort to gather his forces in large numbers to resist Christ's claims. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastures that feed my people, or that claim to feed them. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away, filling their minds with erroneous theories. This work has been done in the past, and at the present time there are men whom we dare not place in positions of responsibility because they do not carry the work forward e wisely. 
they place great confidence in their own judgment. Here again, we are being shown that we are not to have confidence in our own judgment or in the judgment of those that are acclaimed as great speakers. In the Gospels, Peter had great confidence in his own judgment, did he not? Yes, he did. For for how long? Well, God had to break him and show him how horrible it was when when he when he he denied Christ. I mean, Jesus had to personally come to him and reinstate him when he when Peter proved his penitence. For how long was Peter trusting in his own judgment? most of his life however long that but we're speaking of the time in the gospels do we not see that peter was trusting in his own judgment from the time that he was called until the time that christ was crucified where most of this encompasses the first three and a half years of Christ's ministry to Israel. I think that was something that was learned in childhood, though, because the Jews had this concept of themselves as being superior to everybody else. Was Peter trusting in his own judgment after the crucifixion? That he backslid, yeah, he went went fishing. He had given up on 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 himself, which was good, but he had to have proof that Christ had reinstated him. Point. <clears throat> the point that I'm looking at is that with Peter, who was very ardent, very vociferous, very headstrong. He had to learn that confidence in himself, placing his belief in that which he had learned, had to be set aside. And that he needed full and total reliance strictly upon God and not upon himself. We must educate, educate, educate that it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, that God's work is to be accomplished. One thing it becomes us all to learn that none but a true Christian can be a finished gentleman. The Lord Jesus Christ is our example of a true Christian gentleman. To be such a gentleman means much more than we realize. We are preparing for the heavenly mansions, for a city whose builder and maker is God. We are, I am instructed to say, to be partakers of the divine nature. When we yield ourselves to be fully on the Lord's side, the Christianity in the heart will work out in true courtesy and sanctified actions. We have much to learn of Christ. When we seek first to know him, whom we know aright is life eternal, we shall make advancements in the Christian life. 
the charge is given us, ye are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians 3 9. Shall we accept the responsibility? We are not half awake. We are in need of clear spiritual eyesight. If we are not half awake, what are we? Half asleep, or more than half asleep. Right. In what we have studied in the past, in the parable of the ten virgins, only half of them were asleep, right? They were all asleep. And when they were asleep, what church is this representing? Laodicea. Okay. So this message is giving us even further evidence of the Laodicean condition. Because if we are in need of clear spiritual eyesight, we are also in need of the gold that is tried in the fire. And we are in need of the character of Christ. Now from life sketches, Mrs. White gives us, I dreamed that as I was speaking, the power of God fell upon me in a most remarkable manner, and I was deprived of all strength, yet I had no vision. I thought that my husband stood up before the people and exclaimed, this is the wonderful power of God. He has made the testimonies a powerful means of reaching souls, and he will work yet more mightily through them than he has hitherto done, who will be on the Lord's side. I dreamed that quite a number instantly sprang to their feet and responded to the call. Others sat sullen, some manifested scorn and derision, and a few seemed wholly unmoved. One stood by my side and said, God has raised you up and has given you words to speak to the people and to reach hearts as he has given to no other one. He has shaped your testimonies to meet cases that are in need of help. You must be unmoved by scorn, by derision, by reproach, by censure. In order to be God's special instrument, <clears throat> you should lean to no one, but hang upon him alone. And like the clinging vine, let your tendrils intertwine about him. He will make you a means through which to communicate his light to the people. You must daily gather strength from God in order to be fortified, that your surroundings may not dim or eclipse the light that he has permitted to shine upon his people through you. It is Satan's special object to present this light from coming to the people of God, who so greatly need it, amid the perils of these last days. Your success is in your simplicity. As soon as you depart from this and fashion your testimony to meet the minds of any, your power is gone. Almost everything in this age is glossed and unreal. The world abounds in testimonies given to please and charm for the moment and to exalt self. Your testimony is a, of a different character. It is to come down to the minutia of life, keeping the feeble faith from dying and pressing home upon the believers the necessity of shining as lights in the world. Why is this important? Why is it important that this message successfully given will be given in simplicity.
God has given you your testimony to set before the backslider and the sinner his true condition <clears throat> and the immense loss he is sustaining by continuing in a life of sin. God has impressed this upon you by opening it before your vision as he has to no other one now living. And according to the light he has given you, will he hold you responsible? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Isaiah 58, 1. Now, <clears throat> the statement here, according to the light that he has given you, he will hold you responsible. Does that apply just upon those of us in the movement? Or does that apply to all that are currently living in this world? It applies to all. It applies to who? I said it applies to all. And I, I know the statement, I don't know where it's from, but she also said that uh, when we are presented with opportunities to learn more of the truth and we don't take take advantage of that, we're held accountable. That's very serious. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. We all have an opportunity to come to understand what the law is about. We all have the opportunity to come to understand God's character. This dream had a powerful influence upon me. When I awoke, my depression was gone. My spirits were cheerful, and I realized great peace. Infirmities that had unfitted me for labor were removed, and I realized a strength and vigor to which I had for months been a stranger. It seemed to me that the angels of God had been commissioned to bring me relief. Unspeakable gratitude filled my heart for this great change from despondency to light and happiness. I knew that help had come from God. This manifestation appeared to me like a miracle of God's mercy, and I will not be ungrateful for his loving kindness. Now we come to the next verse. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone whereof with shoutings, crying grace, grace unto it. What is a mountain in the scriptures? How should we look at this? Wait, are you trying to use this as a symbol? Yeah. It'd be a church, won't it? Would it? <clears throat> a woman is a church? I don't know if I would use it as a symbol other than as representing just an obstacle. Okay. Like I wouldn't have it represent the kingdom or anything like that. You wouldn't have it representing a government? No, I would not. Would, would you have it representing the gospel kingdom? Um, no. 
I'm, I'm just using the, the, the expression here from Isaiah. That's what I would compare it to. From Isaiah what? Um, well, let me check it. That's what I was using as, as God's church is a government, ain't it? That's what I was thinking anyway. Yeah, so it's Isaiah chapter 40, um, dealing with the uh, uh, you know, voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for your God, for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. So I think it would be more a reference to that idea. So <clears throat> why is it important in this verse for the question to be asked, Who art thou, O great mountain? And then be noted that this mountain before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. So this mountain, before those that are coming from Babylon, shall become a plain. <clears throat> and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof, with shoutings, crying, grace, grace unto it. What else can we find here? Uh, headstone is Christ. Psalm 118, 22. This is about the proclamation of the gospel. So it really does apply to Isaiah chapter 40. Okay. Because the headstone or the head of the corner, the cornerstone, uh, refers to Christ. So, so it's illustrating here a parallel between uh, the giving of the gospel, as presented in Isaiah chapter 40, and... Um, the building of this house, right? This temple, the second temple. Okay. <clears throat> now, this headstone, is this expressed in the masculine or the feminine? The mountain itself, to me, is interesting because of the Hebrew number assigned to it. And if, I, if I'm understanding this correctly, this headstone that is being referenced is in the feminine, not in the masculine. Yeah, I'm just looking this up right now. I'm looking at the Hebrew here. Okay. Um, it's weird. Okay. Uh, Uh, 
Yeah, the Hebrew's a little bit different here. Um, okay, so. Um, Yeah, this is weird. Okay, so there is a word here in the Hebrew that's not even in the King James. Okay. I don't understand why. Um, um, So, and no, so my so. Strong's is on seven two. Sorry, Peter. And my Strong's it says uh, seven two two derived from seven two one eight. I find that seven two one eight intriguing. Yeah. So there's a number six four three eight in Hebrew. Okay. And and that's not even in the King James. So I'm trying to figure out. Why? So it's the word corner, pinna, and okay, so they have. Uh, 6440 before they have panim, but that would not be correct. Um, uh, because the word there, because panim is, is the face, right? That's right. 6440. But in the Hebrew, they have a different word. So, um, so. Yeah, you know, six 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 four six four four zero, you know, would be translated as before. Um, but this word uh pina means corner or chief. Um so I'm trying to figure out how I would translate this considering it's a different word. Um so who is the great mountain, uh, the corner, right? So, so the idea that before, because it doesn't look like that's what the Hebrew says at all. Um, but it's it's possible, possible that uh, it is okay. Anyway, um, so so the word anyway, trying to get back to these genders here. Um, so we have Har Mountain. It's masculine singular, and um, so we're going to say that that's an, uh, to to the corner, to the corner, uh, Zerubbabel. Um, to a plane. So, um, and the word you wanted to know whether it was feminine or not was which one? The headstone? headstone. Correct. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's feminine singular. Okay. Yeah. It's just to have been at the heaven. And okay, yeah, so mountains masculine and stones feminine. Okay. I'm not sure why, why that's significant, but. Well, it's, we're, we're being asked a question here. Mm -hmm. We're being asked, what is the importance of this great mountain? 
Now before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone. So what is Zerubbabel's actions in this as they relate to the movement currently? Uh, I can think of right now, like I was looking at James, I think it's 117, because I was wondering, okay, the face is the part that turns, it says in my, in my strongs, and I thought, okay, in God, there's no variable, it's neither shadow of turning, but that might be way off track, I'll have to look into that later, but then I thought, okay, Christ abased himself for us, so the great mountain becomes a plain for us, are we not called then to, like Christ, abase ourselves, so God can erect, like he can build his temple, of living stones that have no trace of self in them. Like all that earthliness is gone. And then we just reflect Christ. Okay. So Zerubbabel is being presented with this mountain that he will then make out into a plain. And Zerubbabel will bring forth the headstone with shoutings, crying, grace, grace unto it. So it's the second angel's message. Exactly. That's being presented, which is the message. So here again, we're pointing to the to the everlasting gospel. Correct. Um, but it's the second step. That's the proclamation of the gospel. Because the third step is that the gospel has completed its work. Right. Reflecting Christ's character. So. So this, this fits in with Isaiah 40 again. All right. Yeah. Now for manuscript 53 of 1890. Statement is made here. Take not the position that men can be moved by the presentation of the love of God alone. How many times do we find within the church, within the Protestant churches around us, the position that all we need to present is the love of God? We don't need any prophecy. We don't need to understand so many of these things. Just the love of God is all that is necessary for salvation. How many times is this being presented and how many times do we hear this? When does the love of God uh, just let sin go by? Have a doesn't care about sin. I think God has principles, and I know God has principles, and he holds us accountable. So this one statement, this one sentence, is telling us we are not to take the position that the love of God alone is all that needs to be presented. As it was said in the chat, many times we are hearing this. Many times we are finding that there are those that are willing to present this type of fallacy. You may build ever so fine a structure, but it is what? Without foundation. What happens to a structure? What happens to a house? that is built without a foundation. Tilts and falls. And, and I was thinking these people are probably misconstruing. I think it's first Peter four, eight, where it says love covereth a multitude of sins. Yeah. That doesn't mean you conceal sin and you let it fester and you let it kill you spiritually. You get rid of it. So the love of God, the real love of God can be manifested. Exactly. And it said in the chat, in the chat again, the building 
collapses. Dig deep, lay the foundation on Christ alone. <clears throat> a crucified redeemer who died for the transgressor that he should not perish but have eternal life. How? Only by coming back to his allegiance to God's holy law. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 20:21. 20, the law and the gospel go hand in hand. The one is the complement of the other. The law without faith in the gospel of Christ cannot save the transgressor of the law. The gospel without the law is inefficient and powerless. <clears throat> the law and the gospel are a perfect, complete, entire whole. The Lord Jesus laid the foundation of the building, and he says the headstone and he lays the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying grace, grace unto it. He is the author and finisher of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the two blended, the gospel of Christ and the law of God produce the love and the faith unfeigned. So, Headstone. Could this also be a cornerstone of our faith? I read headstone and I think of a marker. I think of a cornerstone and I think of a building that is built securely Christ must dwell in the heart just as the blood is in the body and circulates there as a vitalizing power we have no time to be going around the world to see what kind of terms can be made for the work if there are not businessmen there who can be trusted to see what kind of terms can be made in the things you mention, I feel that we are to be pitied. Lay your plans before men whom you can trust as surely as you yourself can be trusted, who understand your plainly stated necessities as well as you can state them with your voice. There is such a thing as being anxious to make many preparations, but accomplishing but little with what you already have. The thought will come that if you only had all that you thought you need, the difficulties would be removed. The word to Zerubbabel is needed by us all. So who needs this? Is it just the pastors? Is it just the conference officials? Is it just the general conference president that needs this word to Zerubbabel? I would say no, because this, this sentence is clear. This word is needed by all of us. This is needed by all of us within this movement. As he has stated to Zerubbabel, this is not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone of it with shoutings crying grace, grace unto it. Threads of selfishness are woven into the fabric. Every thread should be a golden thread of love 
because the web is the Lord's and every worker should be a worker together with God. You are none of you engaged in your own human work. You are doing the work of God. You are to be united as one mind in God's great firm, putting away all selfish ideas and thoughts. There is quite a heap of rubbish to be cleared away and consumed. This is a corporate work. It's for the group to do. Is this what Mrs. White is saying? This is an individual work. Excuse me, go ahead. Right. Now, I was just going to read there. This is an individual work, a work for time and for eternity. If we wait for our so-called leaders to, to do their jobs, they all ought to be fired, in my opinion. It'll never get done. Now, that's why God has raised us up, because the so-called leadership is not doing the work. And we need to do the work, and we need to be very serious about it. If we're not willing to do this individual work, why are we here? Consider that point, that this is an individual work, a work for time and a work for eternity. Now, this next unpublished document was presented on the 25th day of the second month of the biblical year 5944. Is there any symbol that we see here in 252? Is there anything important for us to consider here? Much more money than was necessary has been expended upon our institutions in America. Those who have done this have supposed that the outlay would give character to the work. The words in Zechariah have come to us. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. It is not the imposing building or the tables provided with delicacies, with everything that patience may be pleased with that will give the work influence it is that faith that works by love and purifies the soul then the word of the lord becomes assurance and those who come as patients to our sanitarium will be convinced that this people are not following cunningly devised fables that they are not controlled by an imaginative religion which merely inspires enthusiasm. Their reason convinces them that the truth we are teaching is reality to us. How many times with this are we showing that we believe in this message? What is needed to give success? A large, expensive building? If so, we cannot have success. Is success represented by the cathedral de Notre Dame. Is success denoted by St. Paul's in London? Is success noted by the tabernacle in Salt Lake City? A 
according to this, this is not so represented. But this does not give success. It is the atmosphere of grace which surrounds the soul of the believer, the Holy Spirit working upon the mind and the heart, which makes him a savor of life unto life and enables God to bless his work. God would bind his family of workers together by common sympathy with pure affection. Love and respect for one another has a telling influence and is representation of practical godliness. Unbelief is cold and repulsive, dark and forbidding, and can only deny and destroy, while the work of faith under all circumstances can lift the head in conscious dignity and firm trust in God. Every youthful hearts, even youthful hearts, may reveal surpassing beauty and glory in the path of self-denial and self-sacrifice by following where Christ leads the way, lifting his cross and bearing it after him to his Father's home in heaven, walking in the path cast up for the ransomed to the Lord to walk in. My kingdom, Christ declared, is not of this world. John 18, 36. It is not established by force or by warfare or by any one man's wisdom. Human power cannot accomplish this warfare. Again, Zechariah 4, 6 is quoted. He addresses every element opposing the work for which he gave his life suffering reproach and rejection by his own people whose moral taste was in accordance with their choice. Away with the Lord Jesus Christ. Release Barabbas, a thief, a murderer, was their choice. Here we are to see Luke, we are to see Luke 23, 18. With thieves and murderers, they, will they have their portion? with all those of like choice. Who are we choosing today? Who is the movement choosing today? Who is the church choosing today? Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. The Lord Jesus Christ came to our world in the form of humanity. He stepped down from his throne as sovereign of heaven. He laid aside his royal robe. His bright crown and clothed his divinity with humanity that he made it possible for him to die for the human race, to make atonement for sin and for transgression. To every soul that is perishing in their sins, he reaches out a hand that has been pierced, that he may grasp the hand of fallen humanity and say, come unto me all that ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you of restraint and obedience, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. His yoke, restraint of our strength, obedience unto God and to his law. What an invitation is this? He places great honor upon men and women and youth in giving everyone the privilege of yoking up with Christ. Whosoever shall heed the invitation are partakers with Christ in his humiliation and sufferings and will be partakers with him in his glory.
in Daniel, we read, but the saints of the most high God shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Daniel 7, 18, and Daniel 12, 10. We are not as a people to part, take part in politics. Come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Now, are we to miss the <clears throat> pairing of Daniel 7, 18 with Daniel 12, 10? I mean, here's with this with Daniel 7, 18, another iteration of a 187, right? right? So what do we have here with Daniel 1210? What are we seeing here? Well, it's the wise and foolish virgins. Meaning? Well, it's the separation of the two classes. You have those that are purified, made white, tried. So that's a three-step process. It refers to the message of the Laodiceans as well. Uh, but the wicked shall do wickedly. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So it's these two classes separated at the end. Did the foolish virgins understand? No. Nope. So here again, July 18th is being combined with another type of those that would represent the foolish virgins of the parable. Christ must dwell in the heart, just as the blood in the body and circulates there as a vitalizing power. We have no time to be going around the world to see what kind of terms can be made for the work. If there are not businessmen here who can be trusted to see what kind of terms can be made in the things you mentioned, I feel that we are to be pitied. Lay your plans before men who you can trust is surely as you yourself can be trusted, who understand your plainly stated necessities as well as you can state them with your voice. There is such a thing as being anxious to make many preparations, but accomplishing but little with that which you already have. The thought will come that if you only had all you suppose you need, the difficulties would all be removed. The word to Zerubbabel is needed by us all. Here we are repeating Zechariah 4, 6, and 7. Again, all of this is being said. Threads of selfishness are woven into the fabric. Every thread should be given, should be a golden thread of love, because the web is the Lord's and every worker should be worker together with God. There are none of you engaged in your own human work. You are doing the work of God. You are to be united as one mind in God's great firm, putting away all selfish ideas and thoughts. There is quite a heap of rubbish to be cleared away and consumed. Again, this is an individual work a work for time, 
and a work for eternity. Zechariah 4, verse 8. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. Why is it important that we're looking now at the hands of Zerubbabel? What is Zerubbabel doing here in laying the foundation of this house? As the translators would look at this, they would look back to Ezra. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets. And the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinances of David, king of Israel. <clears throat> And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. What are we noting here? The hands of oh, the it's a return to what? To return to what? I said it's a return to the old past. Okay. Any other thoughts or ideas? Well, you have the mind to think and the hands to work. That mind and the hands have to be on the same level. They have to be doing the same thing in accord with each other. Is this also not describing the finishing of the work that is to be done, completion of the gospel? Amen. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. So, in the alternate, and in the alternate Hebrew, this verse would read, For who hath despised the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord shall rejoice and shall see the stone of tin in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. What are the seven eyes of the Lord? What's being represented here? Well, Revelation and talks of the seven spirits of God. So, are, are is that supposed to be the the Holy Spirit or seven archangels? Is seven not a number of perfection? Yes, it is. So, is God looking perfectly through this earth? to see what our characters are. Amen. Would it have something though to do with uh, the 2520? Right. So go on please. Well, I mean, Part of the thing that, that we, we miss out in this context is this is about the rebuilding of the temple. 
Right. And that's going to be completed 70 years after its, its destruction, which is the result of um, the seven times of Leviticus 26. Okay. Right. And it actually has the word seven there, which is the same word in Leviticus 26. So it says, uh, they shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel, right? So we know that that plummet is part of the line upon line in uh, Isaiah 28, right? So dealing with um, the cornerstone that's talked about in Isaiah 28. They shall lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Judgment will I lay to the line in righteousness to the plummet. Right, and hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and water shall overflow the hiding place. Right, so the plummet there is the way marks. That's the righteousness, or or the right which, and the number for righteousness is six 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 six. Eager, and the plummet four nine four nine. Um, um, but judgment is the line. So the line is is a reform line, and the plummet is the way marks. Okay. So events. So if you're if you're thinking about that context of Zechariah, then uh, these seven would be the seven times. Now, saying that these are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the earth, it's just saying that through the understanding of the 2520, we can then understand uh, God's, God's investigative judgment, uh, the work that's going on in judging the earth as well. So you've got uh, the plummet, which is righteousness, and then the line that is judgment. Okay. And to and fro means to study, as in Daniel twelve four. Yeah. Now yeah. 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 It means to search. It's an idiom which means to search, right? So, so with the the study of this twenty five twenty, that we can then see and discern uh, this message. At, at least it's it makes sense to me. Okay. What are these small things? Why is it important that we have this day of small things? Well, when we first started reading this, um, she was talking about God being concerned with every facet of our lives, even the tiniest things. So nothing is unimportant to God and how we conduct ourselves in small matters could indicate how we're going to conduct ourselves in larger matters. Is it interesting that this alternate reading gives reference to the seven eyes of the Lord shall rejoice? For what is it meaning for this to rejoice? Is there a deeper meaning than just to be happy? Okay, how are they getting rejoice? So oh, I don't understand that. Okay. I mean, that word's not here anywhere. It's not in the Hebrew? Not that I can see. I'm not sure what they're translating as rejoice. According according to this, uh, you're looking at uh, Samak. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I, I see. I see how they're doing it. So they're just, they're putting this in a different order. So when it talks about the seven eyes of the Lord, there's nothing there about rejoicing. The rejoicing is earlier. Right? Okay. For who had this the day of small things, for they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet of the hand of Zerubbabel. But I'm not sure how they would get, since the eyes of the Lord shall rejoice, 
that doesn't really make sense. Because that's not what it says. Okay. There again, I'm I'm just clearly using okay. what, what the translators had used. Yeah, because um because for they shall re rejoice would not be the eyes of the Lord rejoicing. It's those that see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel that rejoice. Right? All right. Because that's going to be when he finishes the building. Right? Because right now he's laying the found He had laid the foundation. Right? That's Zechariah 4.9. Um. And then he says he's going to finish it. But when he's finishing it, that's when he's going to be using the plummet. So, right, because I, you're, you're building the walls, not the foundation. You use a line to, to do the foundation. But the plummet is for uh, the vertical parts of the building, such as the walls. So it's just saying, even though you're, you're seeing that the day of small things is when you're laying the foundation. It doesn't appear to be, you know, anything great. But when you see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel, then those that see that will rejoice. So, yeah, I see. I'm not sure how they're trying to get um, the seven of the eyes of the Lord shall rejoice. And she'll see the stone of tin in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. Um and especially here, what, what they're having here is they're translating this word plummet is two different Hebrew words. Okay. Uh, Eben is the one. And then uh, tin, right? So so when you're looking at, at the word plummet, um, you're going to have this in... Uh, so... Yeah, so this is going to be uh, translated as tin, tin in other places. It's translated as plummet in Zechariah 4.10. Um, but because it's paired together with the word ebon, that would be the plummet. And when you're looking at Isaiah uh, 28, it's going to talk about uh, the plummet. It's going to use a, a different different word that's all because that's a word weight so the stone of tin would still be the plummet because it's a weight right just happens to be it, it described in uh, Zechariah as as tin or as some kind of weight a, a weighted uh, tin so does that make sense it does Okay. But why <clears throat> in the later part of this of this verse we're, we're being told in the initial translation for they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven with those Sheba they are the eyes of the Lord which run through and to and fro through the whole earth <clears throat> so these seven, which is a reference to the seven times, these are the eyes of the Lord, which search, right? Okay. Right. So that would fit with that symbolizing, bringing us back to the 2520. Right. Now, so they're, they're saying there are seven eyes. That's sort of implied there, right? But it's, or the eyes of the Lord are symbolized by those seven or these seven, right? Whatever these seven are. So it, it, it definitely would refer to something not being referred to uh, like it's not anything that he's talked about. You know, it's not seven people or whatever. It's it's just this seven, right? And so this seven here must refer to the period of time, uh, the seven times of Leviticus 26, of which that 70 years is is a part. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. 
because there's no other seven they could be referring to other than the 2520 as it relates to the building of the temple because the temple was destroyed in connection with the 2520 and rebuilt in connection with the 2520 that is it's uh the fourth seven times when the temple is destroyed oh, it was destroyed according to the curse of Moses. It was rebuilt as part of this under the curse of Moses. Right, exactly. Okay. So that's the only thing those seven or these seven, because in Hebrew there's no distinction between these and those, um, that is being referenced. But it's saying that, that these seven, this is the seven times of Leviticus 26, is the eyes of the Lord, which search the whole earth. And that would make sense in connection with Leviticus 26. Okay. So I, ne I never saw that before in this verse, that this is a reference to the 2520. Kind of interesting what we're finding as we, as we go back through a lot of this, isn't it? Okay. Another non-published manuscript. Years ago, the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the hearts of men to establish in Nashville institutions of learning to educate the colored people of the South. The Lord now desires his people to establish institutions in this center where a good work has already been done. In this place, prejudice is not so easily aroused buildings that can be utilized to advantage may be secured in which to make a beginning. Workers for the colored race are protected so that they can labor in safety, and the buildings in which they carry forward their work are not so liable to be destroyed. The Lord is not pleased with the movements made by those who have opposed the work that centers in Nashville. He reads the heart of every man. Those who have opposed the clear light he gave in regards to making this place a center should have awakened to a realization of their duty to establish centers of influence by erecting memorials for God. If they had manifested a desire to do their best to help, the work would not have been so hard and trying for the laborers, some of whom constantly criticized and accused, have nearly lost their lives on account of overwork and anxiety. Thus was it, thus it was in Nashville. God forbade the brethren in responsibility to take the hasty steps that they decided to take. He said that they were in no case to be allowed to follow such a course. For at that time, they would be unable to remove the wrong impression that would be left on the minds of the people. If changes had been made in the publishing house when the brethren anticipated making them, if those who had worked faithfully had been tried, judged, and condemned according to man's wisdom, a deep and lasting injustice would have been done to the ones misjudged. Too many mismoves have already been made. Men are not gods. Our brethren so desirous of making changes should have remembered that the instruction given to the children of Israel through the prophet of Zechariah, the hands of Zerubbabel, have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it, that thou shalt know the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. 
Now, we're coming to a point where we're about to start a new thought in the book of Zechariah. Is there something further that we need to address today? As we look at this, as we consider this, as we see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel, and as we are giving reference back to the curse of Moses, we need to have thought and consideration for all that is going on currently. Because if we are to become the living stones of the temple built without hands, we need to definitely be prepared and to be ready. There is not to be any of this pointing of fingers, casting out of brothers and sisters, this is not according to God's order. So shall we close this session with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, We thank you for the lessons that are currently before us from that which has gone on in the past. Direct us this day and prepare us. Help us to be ready to do that which you would have us to do. Be with us now. Guide us through these hours of the Sabbath so that we may indeed give glory to your name and to your character. We thank you, Father, for this time that we've spent together. We thank you for the input and the thoughts of the many. We ask, Father, further for your blessing upon them and upon those that will view this later. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.